Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to Ed Up on the Ed Up Experience podcast, where we make education your business. Dr. Joe Salustio, back with you again in another episode. Um, I, I, we have interviewed now, I think, somewhere around 145 college and university presidents. We still think we're the only podcast in the world to do so. Um, why we think that is important is because, you know, these college and university presidents are setting the way forward for the way higher education is going to be in the next uh, bunch of years. And they are a really, really fun group of folks that I think over time, um, it was always like, who, who is this person running this university? And they're the man or the woman behind the curtain and you don't get to see them that much. And then social media happens. And then all of a sudden everybody's out in front now. And the, the, the college and university presidents we're talking to are really savvy, savvy in front of the public, savvy on social media, uh, savvy leaders. And they uh, also wear, I will tell you, they are always champions of their college and university. But I have somebody in front of me today that may be um, the most dedicated uh, uh, person that I know. He told me before we started, he wears purple every single day. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen. He's Dr. James Hurley, and he's president of Tarleton State University. James, what is happening? Dr. Joe, thanks for having me on. I'm a big fan of, of yours, big fan of the podcast. The work you're doing is incredibly important. And uh, I appreciate, as a sitting president, the light that you have shed and continue to, to share with the world on leadership and the importance thereof. I'm a big John Maxwell fan. And so I believe Amen. that everything falls, rises and falls on leadership and what you're doing, you're leading, you're leading the way for our students and stakeholders to, to stay better connected with higher ed. So kudos to you. Thank you, sir. You know what I love about these conversations is the realization that as much as we try to be perfect at the highest level, we all make mistakes. None of us are perfect. COVID really brought that to the forefront. Like, you know what? You want to take a leadership role. Colleges and universities are one of the most affected areas because you have so many stakeholders and nobody knew what to do. And that's what made these episodes so exciting is like, you know what? You want to operate with perfection at the highest level. But you know what? College and university presidents, top leaders, we're humans too. We make mistakes. It's just never perfect. What What is perfect is the passion that we have for students. And you have a lot of that passion at Tarleton State. Talk about the university. What do you guys do? How do you do it? And we'll go from there. Yeah, well, I, I concur. I mean, certainly the pandemic forced us all to think, act, create differently than we've ever created, thought, or even spoke, right? I mean, we took a lot of things for granted in higher ed. And, and certainly at, in an institution like Tarleton State, the, the genesis of our institution, the DNA of, of Tarleton, if you will, we were founded 122 years ago as, as an agricultural college. It was a two-year, you know, much like many of the institutions in the West, two-year junior colleges at that point that was really uh, designed to, to, you know, fill a, a, a niche need in the region. And ours was agriculture. We're in rural central Texas, although we're not so rural now. Uh, the last 10 to 15 years, the growth of the Metroplex has really started to creep into cities like uh, Stephenville. So we have roughly uh, nearly 15,000 students, a few thousand faculty and staff members. Uh, we are 50, Joe, what I think you'll love about our institution, 54% of our students are first generation. That's amazing. Yeah. And nearly, amazing. Uh, and nearly 36 to 38% of those students are, are Pell eligible. So we really teach and train and mentor and lead students that uh, that need that face-to-face hands-on education that's who we were who we are what we have become over the last call it five to eight years is more of a a, a technology uh, minded I, I don't want to say based institution and so we understand the need and importance of of enhancing technology and building these hybrid approaches so that's who we are 97 percent of our students come from the great state of Texas. So we truly meet the regional comprehensive need. We're the second largest school in the Texas A&M system. And you and I spoke earlier, we're the eighth fastest growing public regional university in the nation. So we, lots of growth, lots of pro, uh, prosperity. 
And we, uh, we have the third largest number of Texas counties represented at an institution only behind Texas A&M, College Station, and UT Austin, which they have all 254 counties. So we're a fast growing and, and we've really grown beyond just this regional comprehensive university. We, real, we are now a statewide entity. Now, you, you didn't say it before, you said it kind of in sentence that you, Tartland State is an um, institution within the Texas A&M University system. T- talk about that a little bit, what that ecosystem looks like. How many institutions are we talking about and how your part, why your part is so important in the A&M? Yeah, great, great, great question. Correct. Great, great point. Absolutely. So the Texas A&M University system is comprised of about 100, and I think the number now is 60 plus thousand students across 11 universities. We also have eight uh, agencies, and some of those agencies are state, formerly state-sponsored or state-supported institutions that now reside inside the university. Um, So we are, you know, very comprehensive. We have about $1.1 billion in research across the system. So we are a very large research enterprise. Um, And again, we're one of the largest providers of of not only research, but, but, um, you know, educational um, student practitioners, if you will. So many of our students that go to Texas A&M are first gen. We have Mm -hmm. the largest number first gen in the Texas A&M system. I mean, I want to talk about the community impact uh, of, of what you're doing, but before I do, um, somebody has crashed my podcast today and uh, I want to bring her in. Uh, you know, you, you will recognize her by the sound that I play when she comes in, which of course I did not prepare in advance because I didn't know she was going to crash, but I have something that's almost, um, similar. So ladies and gentlemen, let me bring her in. Her name is Dr. Michelle Cantu Wilson. I don't know that if that was quite the air horn, Michelle more of a lazy trumpet. It's really sad, Joe, but I appreciate that you tried and that you're accommodating me. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here today. Hello, Dr. Hurley. Michelle, it's good to see you. And it, on my end, it sounds more like a foghorn down on the, the, <laughs> the Galveston Bay, right? <laughs> That's appropriate. I am close to the Galveston Bay. So that well, is- Since we were doing the whole Texas thing today, I thought Michelle would be the perfect crasher. Of course, Michelle's the director of teaching and learning initiatives and special projects at San Jacinto College. Michelle, always right. an honor to have you here. Thank um, you, Joe. And there's, I have a connection to Dr. Hurley. I don't think um, you mentioned me because I'm crashing, but Dr. Hurley, I went to Ranger. Um, oh, wow. Just down the road. My, yep. Yes, sir. I got my associate's degree there and spent a lot of time in Stephenville as oh, a Ranger oh. student. So. Oh, welcome. You're always. <laughs> I'm starting to think now that the air horn's gone, Michelle. <laughs> That's the Galveston Bay. I mean, I, I, so in the quick research, I knew Michelle would understand. I didn't know she went to Ranger, but I did. Uh, know her where her university is located and I thought okay that's as close to the Galveston Bay as I you know possibly could could come up with and I did not know Joe was going to play that so sad sad. in fact yes and and so before I give Michelle the mic to ask you a bunch of questions I let's go back just a a tad uh, before she uh, was so amazingly introduced here and talk about the community impact of of Tarleton State University the Texas A&M system I mean you know for the number of counties that you're serving the 15,000 students you must be putting billions of dollars into the local economy yeah, we are. We're north of a billion um, just in using our 2019 census data. And so you fast forward, you know, we've grown nearly, you know, a few thousand kids during that time frame. And we will reconstitute, if you will, another um, economic feasibility study. And we will use our 2022 data, which will show that it's, it's probably closer. You're exactly right, Joe. It's going to show about a billion and a half direct economic uh, impact. And we all know when you have close to 1.5 billion in direct, there's lots of ancillary um, economic benefits and and that aren't equated in that number. And that's what really makes a place like Tarleton so critical and vital to to meeting the needs of the region. Hmm. Michelle, over to you. Even though you're a party, you're the podcast crasher. 
<laughs> I am. I don't want to give you that moniker though; that it'll stick with you forever. I could go anywhere with that, Joe. I really could. I, mm -hmm. I may never come back. Um, so, Dr. Hurley, because I know the the area, um, I'm familiar with the landscape and the geography. How do you think Charlton has changed? Um, since you've arrived, or if you could say in the past 10 to 20 years, in terms of it being a draw for students who are not just local? Yeah, that's, that's a great question and a great observation, Michelle. You, so you know firsthand, 20 years ago, and we could even say 10 years ago, Stephenville was still very, very rural, right? The, the Tarleton State University concept, we had about five to 6,000 students then. Um, more regional, more commuter. We now have 4,000 beds on campus. The infrastructure has just been incredible over the last five years. And then of course, the last three to four years, our growth here um, has exploded. But if you look at it historically from over the last 10 years, uh, Tarleton had some of the fastest growth rates in the country. And so we were really, really, you know, we were growing very quickly. And the administration prior to me and, and, and also in the system, they had to quickly address some of these needs. The needs were in housing because we found more students from across the state, 200, nearly 240 of the 254 counties will be represented this fall. And so students want to come here because one culture of the institution, the amenities that we offer, but I also think the safety of our campus, the safety of the town, those types of things really resonate with students, especially first generation. We know that the Hispanic graduate uh, out of high school is the largest and fastest growing sector. And so family uh, connection, being part of, of a family atmosphere is really important uh, to, that, to that sector of student. And so we, we offer that, as you know, Michelle, we offer that here at Tarleton State. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I came 10 hours away from home. I'm from the Rio Grande Valley. And so it was a solid 10 hours to Ranger. And I will say that when we went to dance at Tarleton for whatever, I was on the dance team at Ranger, um, whatever events we attended, it was a family atmosphere. And that must feel really, really nice. Uh, another connection is um, your dance team coach for years was Letitia Ryan Carr, who went to Ranger with me. So she ended up being so connected and she's also Latina. And so she felt so connected that she decided to be employed there. So let's talk about that. What is the draw for um, your faculty and your staff um, being part of an institution like Tarleton that does have that family feel that is connected to so many students across the state? What do you find that they say is the reason that they keep returning? Mission, mission of the institution. And, and that mission is, is grounded in core values. It, it's grounded in and, and, you know, clearly faculty want to be part of an institution that, that wholeheartedly believes and supports the mission of being academic, um, you know, academically excellent. Um, the, the, we still teach and, and display and mentor uh, the core value of respect and integrity, right? Those are really, really important to us. And, and so having those common core values that faculty and staff believe in. Also, we're, again, Michelle, you know our institution, I was, I was sharing with Joe earlier in the audience, we're very much a face-to-face, hands-on institution. We have certainly uh, made tremendous strides over the last four to five years in technology. We, we offer more hybrid approach, um, teaching and learning. The models are different, certainly since the pandemic, but we very quickly, more probably faster than any institution in Texas and maybe in the country, we got back to that face-to-face -face model as fast as possible because that's why students choose Tarleton State University. It's really hard to teach ranch management or natural resource management online, right? And so many of our students come for, for those types of programs. And so it was imperative that we put our faculty in front of our students and that's where they thrive. And that's why our faculty come back is we're true to mission. 54% again of our students are first gen. A lot of our faculty and staff here are first gen. I'm a proud first gen poverty product. And so that's something that I don't hide behind. Uh, the folks across the country know that I'm one of the, you know, the champions for first generation uh, educational initiatives because I think that's the one true way that we can break this cycle of educational poverty is through it's through education and through higher education public higher education 
Normally I would jump in here because Michelle had to, like, we do this kind of two question, two question thing, but she's so passionate about first gen students. I feel like you'd want to jump in again here, Michelle. How do we know each other so well? Oh my goodness gracious, Joe. Sorry. <laughs> Dr. Hurley, we know how important it is for first gen students. I share uh, your background as a first gen student from poverty, I'm very proud of that and always try to lead with that when I'm talking to students. Um, my background is creating mentoring for students, mentoring programs for students. Um, and we've had a successful mentoring program at San Jacinto College for a while um, that was derailed by the pandemic. How do you incorporate mentoring or academic coaching or success coaching of first gen students into your campus culture? Do you, do you, see, do you value that? Do you make that a core component or does it just happen naturally? Now, the, again, great question. Uh, so we have a program here uh, and it's called I Am a Trailblazer, right? And of course, as you can imagine, it's all purple and white and it's, it's, it, it's all about being, being a first generation trailblazer. That trailblazer doesn't only resonate with our students, it also resonates with faculty and staff because they were not only the first, for me, I'm, not only were, was I the first in my family to go to college. I'm certainly the first to become a college professor and a college administrator. And out of that, you know, thankfully my son will enroll at West Point next year. And that's amazing. Uh, Congratulations. Yeah, we're, we're really proud of him. A excellent student, um, tremendous opportunity ahead of him. But I think Drew would tell you that had dad not, you know, broke that cycle of poverty and became college administrator, he may not have had the same aspirations. And that's just one story. That's not a president's story. That's a dad's story. So it's a very real and meaningful to me. And we have so many parents that just want better for their children. And, and so many first-gen students, they come from homes that their parents are very supportive. The first-gen student today, Michelle and Joe, you know this, the first-generation learner today looks very different than all, when all three of us were in school. Right, because of the outreach, the trio, the university programs, the federal and state programs that are available, students are more equipped. They're more aware. They may not have the confidence and and the the um, the skills, the the study habits, et cetera, developed yet. But they have more knowledge than they've ever had about how to navigate college, or at least the process to start thereof. So we're really, really excited about all the initiatives. We have a lot of first-gen celebrations. We celebrate those successes here. The one thing that we try to do too is every single first-generation student at Tarleton is, is a, a matched with a first-generation mentor. That could be another student. That could be a staff member. That could be a faculty. That could be an administrator like myself. I have a group of first-generation students that, that I mentor and we're very close with. And that's really, really important to ensure that they do not have to navigate these bumps in the road by themselves. And our TRIO program here at Tarleton is second to none. They really, really focus on meeting the needs of the students, but more importantly, meeting those students where they are. Okay, so I gotta, I gotta, I gotta ask this question because you both have brought up what I think is like the issue to discuss. And I don't wanna ask you guys as higher ed professionals, I wanna ask you as dad, and mom, because I follow Michelle on Instagram, so I know she's mom and all over the place. So, so I know that you both you both mentioned you have kids. I have kids too, and um, a little bit younger. But but this conversation that you just had, first gen students. All right, so you're a first gen student, and when you were thinking about college, someone must have said to you, "Go to college and get your degree." And if you do, if you do you're gonna change the trajectory of your family for generations. Maybe you'll be, we, you'll have more economic benefits. You're going to have more, I don't know, status is the wrong word, but you're gonna to elevate to new positions and so on and so forth. Um, a lot of people of color are first gen students now, as you look at the multicultural majority and this conversation, this very confusing conversation around, do I go forward with higher education and get a degree or do I not? And you know, somebody over here is telling me the degree doesn't mean as much as it used to, and I should go and get some skills. And and then I've got these people over here that say the degree is worth something. And you look at any social media site, 
any conversation with a couple of people that are in the higher ed ecosphere and you have a very confusing message with no consensus. And I'm asking you as mom and dad, could you look at your kids in the face as first gen students and say, you don't need to go to college? No, I absolutely could not. Because again, I just shared the story of what it did for my family. And that's one family, right? Out of Let's just use the United, the numbers in the United States. That's what, 368 million people, whatever, we're closer to 370 million people. That's but, one- but James, college is just too expensive. It's too expensive and, and people are in debt for the rest of their lives. And the, you know, higher ed is doing disservice to people of color and first gen students because of this cost, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. All right, answer that question. That, that's the few pundits that, that yes, one could listen to. It is our job. As, and, you know, and I feel like it's imperative being the president of an institution that teaches and, and kind of shouts from the mountaintop access, opportunity, and affordability. And, and I'm a product of that. And so I would not be on this podcast with you had it not been for someone, my fourth grade teacher, Miss Irene Strongmore. She said, you have an incredible talent you're smart and you have to get out of the coal fields of East Kentucky, right? You're not going to be an underground coal miner. You're going to use your intellectual ability to make it. And we need to ensure that we are equipping our teachers at the P12 level too, because they're really the individuals that are molding and shaping the thoughts of our young people. And if they come out of intermediate, elementary, middle and high school, thinking and believing that they can and they will then it's imperative that us as higher ed, uh, ed leaders all of us all three of us on this podcast we have to ensure that we're helping them um spread the message hey everybody head over to www.edupexperience.com our website where you're going to find all of the episodes that we've recorded categorized so that you can ensure that you're spending your time listening to the podcasts that are most important to you. You're going to see the reviews of our podcast, the shows in our network, our partners, and a section on starter episodes. If you're new to the EdUp experience, listen to those starter episodes and get a feel for how the podcast has evolved over time and our impact in the world. www.edupexperience.com. I love the dad answer there. What about you? What's the mom answer, Michelle? You just turn tell your kids, don't even sweat college. It's not even <laughs> worth it. I did, you know, what Dr. Hurley said resonated so much because I'm the oldest of 26 grandkids. I'm the first and the first to go to college. And it changed our family's lives. It changed not just my family. I have, my grandmother had nine children. And so my cousin's lives were changed because I went to college and my aunts and uncles bought into it and they believed in it and they pushed it. How many families did we change through one example? That's the power of higher education. And I challenge, like Dr. Hurley does, I challenge the pundits because there is something here for everyone. In college and universities, in community colleges and universities, there are programs, there are short-term short -term credentials that can change a family's ability to get life, family sustaining wages. Um, there are stackable credentials that will take you to a degree if that's what you're ready for. You could become a bank teller. You could get certified in project management. There is something here for everyone. It doesn't have to be a four-year degree, but does college help you in the long run? Absolutely, hands down. And, and that's the expectation that I set for my family. No one really said it for me other than just, you know, my father saying you're going to be a career woman and me not having any idea what that meant. But understanding that college was part of that formula. Um, for a lot of our students, and especially for first gen, Dr. Hurley, I think you'll agree, um, there's this misperception that there's no parent support. And you said it earlier. Absolutely there is. Parents are totally supportive. They just don't have the language or the access or the information. And I think that that responsibility falls on the colleges and universities. So what you're doing to partner a student with someone on campus who can help them navigate is powerful. What you're doing to educate the community is powerful. Um, it's on us to change the perception that people have of our communities, right? Because if you're involved in higher ed, you know the truth. If you're not, it's easy to be critical. Um, come do the work yeah. with us and you'll find out what's really- Well said, well said.
Yeah. I think about this all the time because I interview so many people. I literally think about this as I'm going to bed and I'm going, I almost think I would rather go into significant debt to be able to send my kid to college because I don't think I could die knowing that I didn't give my kids that opportunity. Like I would regret it for the rest of my life to go, I somehow convinced my kid not to go to college. And yeah, maybe even if they made it successful, but what if they didn't? And I would regret it forever. Right. And I'm just like, and I'm, and it's hard because I'm supposed to be this impartial podcast host. And, you know, I'm saying, you know, if, if somebody says, you know what, you don't need a degree, I go, oh, yeah. And if they say, you do need a degree, I say, oh, yeah. But I have opinions too, guys. I mean, gosh, I've been do, you know interviewing a lot of people. And it's like, man, I get it. But if you just look, there are ways to get a college education that are economical. You just have to look. But if you're going to, if you're going to do it with some, you know, sense of, well, my kid's going here and where, I mean, then it, that's where it becomes bad. And you know what I mean? I, I mean, we should be excited about a college education in general. Anyway, I'm, I'm soapboxing. No, and, and real quick, no, Go that's ahead, a, James. we sensationalize certain success stories of individuals that yes, they did not attend college. They navigated the system and became insanely successful. It, because again, going back to that niche, they knew they were able to do something really well at a period of time where it the stars aligned. But those are so rare, right? For everyone else, the wage earning capacity with a college degree, an associate's baccalaureate, master's plus, is significantly. Now we're we were seeing that the wage earning, remember when we used to say a, a bachelor's degree is worth $1 million more than a high school diploma. That number now is like 1.48 million. It's almost one and a half million dollars over a college or just a high school diploma. But you also have to remember about the genesis of those individuals, Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, all these folks, they were at Ivy League institutions. So they started the process, right? The really, really smart people. So we have to be really careful of the narrative that we let others paint for these young people that they were successful and you can do the same without a college degree. That's not, on average, that doesn't work. The math doesn't add up. Love it. Well, guys, uh, as you know, uh, I like to play a game every now and then. Uh, it's called Higher Ed Word Association. And your contestants today are Michelle and James. And I'm going to give them a one or two word statement phrase, and they're going to give me the first group of thoughts that come to their head. Are you guys ready? We're ready. Michelle, right, Michelle you go first, please. Yeah, we get to start with Michelle because we like to see our guest co-host mess up before our guest gets uh, gets gets the phrase, at least on the first go round. I worry. Michelle, here we go. You ready? Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure you're ready. Sad, you was, was that a prompt? Because that's sadness. It's just to prep you. Okay. All right. <laughs> Value <laughs> proposition. Joe, uh, oh my gosh. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay. So a uh, buzzword, honestly. I, I appreciate that these words are important in higher ed, but just say, just say values. You know, families have values. People have values. Students have values. And we don't always have to um, illustrate those. Um, we can just demonstrate, you know, through our actions. So if I want to show my community surrounding San Jacinto College that I care about the community and about families, then they're going to be part of my community and my actions will show that. Um, so first response was buzzword. Illustrate. No, don't illustrate, demonstrate. If I had the air horn button, I would press that sucker like 15 <laughs> times because the answer was so good, but I won't hit the sad trumpet because that would be counter counterintuitive. All right, James, follow that one. Value right. proposition. Return on investment. So I think when I hear the word value proposition, what they're really asking is what's the return on investment? What, what let's put, we're again, dad dad mom on the podcast right now let's look at it from a parent perspective if i hear the word value proposition in tarleton state university as a parent i'm going to ask what is the return on the investment that i'm willing to make 
for Drew to attend Tarleton State University, earn an engineering degree and go on to do X, Y, Z. So I would, I would say return on investment. I agree with Michelle. I think it's a buzzword. I think it's, you know, the pundits want to use you know, value proposition, but you never hear them talk about return on investment. So I would counter with ROI. Okay. Uh, James, now you go, you get to go first. Access. Opportunity, affordability, and all means all. I think access means that all means all that if we're going to have an, an, an accessible institution, an accessible culture of providing, you know, again, educational opportunity, then you have to let all students have that access. And for us here at Tarleton, since, since I've arrived, I simply say all means all. That's around DEI initiatives. That's around first-gen initiatives. That's around teaching research, scholarship, all those things that, that are really, really important. It's about cr creating opportunities and avenues of access for individuals to, you know, to have, a, again, an opportunity to be successful. Michelle access. And I know you, I know you got this one. You know how I feel about this one. Um, so I've said before, um, access doesn't equal success, but if you include intentional support, like what Dr. Hurley's talking about, making sure that students have what they need and that the community is ready to welcome them and take them all the way through to what their goals are, then they're more likely to experience success. But um, I was, I was free to apply to a university and I did, I was accepted to St. Edwards, which is a private university, but I didn't know that. So I got access, but that did not turn out to be my success at a private university in Texas. Um, so access plus intentional support can certainly impact success. Okay, and since we're getting to this time of year, I'm gonna give a little bit of a, a, a festive a word here. Commencement, over to you, James, commencement. Commencement celebration. It's a time that we here at Tarleton celebrate the successes of our students and certainly the efforts of our faculty and staff. But again, it's for us, it's, it's watching those first gen students over half of the students that we commence walk across the stage for the first time in their family's histories. And it really is a celebration. Like everyone says that and here it is. I mean, it's we, um, we have it at our, you know, at football arena because we have large, large crowds. And it's, it's the culmination of hard work, dedication, perseverance of these graduates and, and watching them, uh, you know, close that particular chapter on, on an educational journey. It's just, to me, it's, it's the best holiday, right? It's my favorite holidays commencement. So I should say, I'll back up, Joe. When you say the word commencement, I'm going to say favorite holiday. Oh, yeah. Love it. Michelle, commencement. He made me smile the whole time he was talking because I could see how personal it is. And that was my word is commencement is personal. Yeah, I, if you are sitting on the stage or in the audience as a member of the faculty or the staff and you don't feel moved um, by what's happening uh, through the demonstration of like for us, we have all first gen students stand. And that's such a huge deal. We have all veterans stand. We have all parents stand. Um, if you don't feel anything, then it's time for you to, to move on to a different opportunity. Um, but it's personal because I think we see ourselves and we see the hope of the future with every student that crosses the stage. And I also think about what Dr. Joe May um, from Dallas College said at a Texas Pathways Conference um, last year. He said someone has to own the transition after college, after graduation, you know, we're hearing, and I did some focus groups recently, I'm hearing students say, after I graduate, now what? Like, I still need help. Is, can I come back? Can I come back and, and talk to someone about what job? Or So I think there's also opportunity after commencement for us as institutions to say, you know what, I'm going to put a little group together, just a couple of staff people who can be there just for graduates who want to come back and talk about how to navigate, you know, through the job, you know, find or the job hunt or resume building or just idea bouncing related to their careers. So I thought you were going to say addictive, right? Commencement is addictive. addictive. <laughs> it's addictive. <laughs> I guess so. Because once That's you go word, once, Joe. you want it again. And then all <laughs> of a sudden you're sitting with a bachelor's degree and you see those people walk across the stage and you're like, I want to 
happy. I want this feeling. I want to be celebrated. And next thing you know, you got a master's degree and you two and me, next thing you know, you got a doctoral degree. Next thing you know, you're sending more people to get their degrees because that feeling is something you can, it's like that thing you cannot recapture ever, but you strive to recapture that feeling again of, of accomplishment. And it's almost impossible to replicate. That's why when people say, I'm not going to walk, I'm like, are you kidding me that is the worst <laughs> decision you could ever make anybody who says they won't walk i i just it's like oh it is all that time and work and you're not gonna walk what a mistake and because it's addictive it's so an addictive Joe, is it your book titled commencement it is in I fact think michelle thank you book, i think your follow-up book is has just been written and it's commencement is addictive oh yeah I, I, yeah maybe i'm gonna i don't know if i'm gonna let you title my books but it could be <laughs> It could be, uh, I, but but isn't it addictive, you guys? Isn't it this is awesome. what we do? For sure, what it's all about. Yeah. It's so fun. Well, that's my favorite holiday. So I love it. Incredible. Well, that that was a quality episode of Higher Ed Word Association with your contestants, Michelle and James. Uh, Michelle, you lost. No guest coast could ever win. James, you've won no money. Uh, it's impossible <laughs> for us to give out any money because we never have any. We're in higher uh, ed. That's right. Yeah, public higher that's ed. That's right. Worse. Yeah, no money. So I've got one more question, and then Michelle will probably have one, and we'll clo close it out. Uh, how, James, how have you gotten Tarleton State to be one of the top 10 fastest-growing public universities in the country? Everybody wants to know the how these days. How, how are you doing it? Well, for us, you know, during the pandemic, one of the things we did, we were one of the few institutions that actually started and completed our strategic plan during the pandemic. Uh, we didn't put it on pause. We clearly articulated to our stakeholders that we were going to um, not allow this pandemic to define our future. And we were going to define our own future. Part of that, it was strategic planning. We wanted to chart the course for the next 10 years. And I know 10 years is a long time, but there are paths of, 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 certainty that we wanted to take. Number one, we want to be the premier comprehensive regional university in the nation by 2030. That was the non-negotiable. That's the 10 year goal. Yeah. Every year, those goals, uh, the five uh, strategic goals will, will not change, but the pathway and how we get there by 2030 will change because 10 years is a long time. Um, secondly, the very first initiative I launched when I arrived in 2000, uh, summer of 2019, we created what was called the Distinguished High School Partners Program. And I have personally visited 100, to date, 134 high schools and ISDs. Amazing. And that, I think, really made a difference in being able to get out uh, to our regional ISDs and share the Tarleton story and to let students know about, A, who Tarleton is, what is our DNA, what can we provide, and how can we make their lives better? But in, in the course of what we were doing was also reconnecting with alumni that were leading our school systems, our schools via superintendencies, present, uh, principals, counselors, teachers, et cetera. And it was a great way for me to learn Texas, people in place, right? Moving here from East Tennessee a little over three and a half years ago, it was a sure way that I could connect with alum and really focus on recruiting more students. So that was really, really important. So these high school connections and the program has made a big difference. I do believe, Joe, that our um, enhanced investment in research and then also we elevated our athletic affiliation from NCAA Division II to NCAA Division I joining uh, the Western Athletic Conference. That made a huge difference for us because institutional profile and, and, and brand awareness is critical in Texas. We have a very fast growing state. I heard our speaker yesterday presented, um, uh, I was in a meeting with him and he said that we have over 1,030 individuals that are moving to the state every single day. I think, I think don't hold him or me to this number. I think he said the number was 1,039 people are moving to this state every single day. So yes, it. we have a very, it's unbelievable. We have a very fast growing state but there's lots of competition as well. So brand awareness made a big difference. And the degree worth, right? The perceived degree worth at Tarleton has really enhanced and increased over the last five to 10 years. Michelle? 
Well, you answered the question I was going to ask, so I had to come up with another one. I was going to ask you, you know, how do you reach out to the locals? Um, because when I went to Ranger, that was a term I'd never heard before. Um, it was, I was not local because I was a transplant from another city coming to Ranger College. And I knew how important the values of the town were. You could see it in everything that was done. Um, so you answered that really well. So I'm going to pivot a little bit. We know how hard the pandemic has been on our students, right? And you mentioned that you transitioned pretty quickly back to face-to-face -face as much as possible into hybrid. How, how do you support your faculty who have been um, in the classroom with students who have had such intense experiences over the past um, two years? And, and how do you celebrate to make things a little bit lighter and a little bit fun uh, for, for those faculty who are doing what you know I consider just a life's mission in the classroom. Yeah, that's a really, I think it's more of a great point than a question because I, I, all of us are doing what we can to celebrate successes. And neither of you have seen this, but I literally, as Joe and I were, were kind of logging on, I made my face, my, I'm sorry, my Twitter and my Instagram post. We had a faculty celebration this morning where we, my wife and I, we, hosted all the faculty and staff for about a three and a half hour period. They could come and go for breakfast, tacos, donuts, coffee, just to say, hey, we know that this, you know, we're coming to a crash course here at the end of the semester. It's been fast. It's been furious. But we want to say thank you. Thank you for all the little things that you do. Stop by, grab a coffee, uh, donuts as you're, as you're, you know, heading to give your final exam of the semester because we're, we're in the midst of final exams here. The other part is we want to invest in, in our human capital. We made it a strategic priority in our strategic plan to continue investing. So over the last two years, our faculty have received a 7% merit increase. There are very few institutions that are, that are making that type of investment into our faculty and staff. And, and we want to keep our best and brightest uh, talent. We are now in a talent acquisition economy because if you think about the, the, you know, what's going on in the, with this jobs war across the country, right? And those that can acquire the, the most talent, the best talent, the talent that will stick and stay, so to speak, those are the institutions, organizations, entities that are really going to propel and prosper moving forward. So we want our people to know here at Tarleton, our Texans, our Tarleton State University Texans, that they're valued, they're important, and their work's important. I try to make... I, as many faculty and staff events as possible, we're there. And I think you have to be omnipresent and you, you, they have to know that you care. We just had Dr. Falkenberry released a book and Kendall and I wanted to make sure that he understood our value. And so I went and spent you know, 45 minutes at his book signing, bought a book myself, had him personalize my book because it meant more to me than it probably did him. But I wanted to value, that's just one small example. But I know it meant a lot for me to take 45 minutes out of my day that I don't have, but I wanted to create that time to, to value his work. And that's one example of what we try to do across the spectrum here at Charleston State University. It goes back to Michelle family. They have to know they're part of the family. And I do believe if you look at her retention, her graduation and enrollment numbers, they're all skyrocketing in the right direction. And that's because people are bought into what we're doing. And as a result of that answer, uh, faculty applications to Tarleton State University have gone up by an incredible 75%. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Not a bad <laughs> plug. I, I love it. Hey, you know what? When you're giving increases, it's uh, it's a wonder that people would want to teach. It's it's great. And we all know that teachers are underpaid all across the spectrum of faculty and, and K-12 teachers. Anyway, uh, get to our final two questions, James, that we like to ask every single guest. Number one, what did we miss about Tarleton State University? Something you want to say that you came in here wanting to say that we didn't get to? Events, thoughts, anything that's on your mind, plug the website, Any take, take a minute and plug the university. And then number two, what do you see as the future of higher education? Well, to start, you know, Tarleton State University is a, just a great institution. I would encourage anyone that, that has an interest in pursuing a, an institution that really focuses on, on values, that focuses on the, the individual student experience. We know our students' names. Yes, we're growing. We're going to continue to grow at a significant rate. 
but we're not going to grow at the point where we no longer know the hopes and dreams and aspirations of every single student. And our faculty and staff wholeheartedly uh, believe that they, they, they've been bought in for many, many years and they're doing great work. Um, so I, you know, anyone could visit tarleton.edu, learn more about us. I would encourage those that are trying to, to lead a strategic plan or a strategic program or just a new thought. We have some great thought leaders here. Uh, we endured the pandemic differently. You know, we came out about 8% in growth during, during that time and when a lot of other institutions did not. So we, we have a lot of tremendous leaders across this campus that they could connect with. We want to be collaborative. We're not an institution that believes in holding great ideas. We want everyone to know that we share those ideas. The future of higher education, that's a great question. And I think that's going to be a tremendous case study over the next five to 10 years. It's going to continue to evolve. Uh, certain, I think you're going to see more uh, collaborative efforts in terms of, unfortunately, I think we will lose some institutions over the next five to 10 years because of financial solvency. I think you're going to see some incredible mergers. And some of those mergers aren't going to be out of necessity. They're going to be out of opportunity where two or three institutions see the value and in, in kind of banding together and creating, you know, access back to Michelle's access. You know, she's passionate about access. I'm passionate. Joe, you're passionate about access. How can we enhance and increase access and opportunity? Clearly, Joe, this is your world. You know it better than I. This global economy, this global um, educational um, opportunity that we have in front of us, it's, it's going to dominate uh, the, the platforms over the next five to 10 years. And we have to become more nimble and we have to start meeting students where they are, period. And I think those institutions that will do those things are going to be really, really successful. Fire. That is a answer full of fire, James. I appreciate it. It's uh, boy, this has got to be one of my favorites. I, I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, and and just to you, Michelle, uh, I set you up saying that you crashed, but I did forget to send you the link. I didn't want to admit to that until the end. <laughs> um, after after I could use you to my you know to create a little bit of humor, I did not send her the link in time. Got an email from Michelle saying, "Is there a link?" So I did. I'm thinking about doing that on to future guest hosts as well. I feel like. Uh, <laughs> That, I kind of like the crash in the, the yeah. foghorn, you know, Joe, I think you should really consider, you know, maybe something else. Uh, you know, Just James, if I do change it, it I'm going to, it'll be attributed back to this interview that Dr. James Hurley suggested it. I feel like this is just the last sound that comes out of the air horn before you have to buy a new one. <laughs> There's my guest co-host, Dr. Michelle Cantu-Wilson. Michelle, thanks for coming today. Thanks for having me. This was one of my favorites as well. Absolutely. I enjoy it. Thank you, Dr. Hurley. You are very, very inspiring. I enjoy this. Thank you. Michelle, Thank I want you, you to make sure you're drinking that coffee out of your mug, by the way, out of your Ed Up mug. Did you see my Ed Up mug? I got a co-host Ed Up mug. I was so excited because he put, and this is why you can't change my sound, La Reina del Air Horn, which means the queen, the queen of the air horn, Joe, not the fall. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Well said. Well said. I will not forget this podcast for sure. It's been fun. And I was sincere when, in my opening. I appreciate what you're doing to um, to enhance the voice of presidents and, and educational leaders across the country because it we're all in this together. And there's right. not enough fingers and toes to to you know to dike the the water. And um, it takes all of us banding together. So, and we do serious work. And sometimes it's okay for us to have a little bit of fun along the way. Uh, my guest right today, now. Dr. James Hurley, president of Tarleton State University. Thank you, my friend. Um, it was an honor having you here. And ladies and gentlemen, you've just ed up. <laughs> <laughs>